Namaste and good evening all. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Good. Respected Dr. Kalladi, Professor and Head College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, German TD Medical College, Alapura. Distinguished speaker, Dr. Alice Paulos, Ambulatory Care Pharmacist, Hamilton Health Sciences, Ontario, Canada. Honorable members in the panel, Dr. Jim C. Matthew, Dr. Eben Chandra Kumar, Dr. Vishnu S., respected Dr. Dilip KJ, dear students, respected teachers, colleagues, friends, and my dear fellow pharmacists. On behalf of COPS Global, I extend a warm welcome to all the participants who have joined us today. COPS Global, a collective of pharma professionals graduated from College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government Medical College, Tirundurim, proudly presents Pharma Fair, international webinar series in partnership with College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government TD Medical College, Alapura. Today is the second webinar in the series two. And the topic for today's webinar is roles and responsibilities of hospital pharmacists. This webinar is designed to provide an insight into hospital pharmacy practice roles and responsibilities, the skill sets required, and of course, opportunities available for students in Canada, Middle East, and in India. First of all, let me invite Dr. Kala D. Kala Madam, Professor and Head, College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government TD Medical College, Alapura, to inaugurate today's webinar and to deliver the inaugural address. Kala Madam, over to you, Madam. Thank you, Rindish. Warm good evening to one and all. Pharmacy is a dynamic, growing and increasingly diverse profession which is an integral part of healthcare system. Pharmacists have expanded their role from dispensing to pharmaceutical care by maximizing the benefit of medication and their safety. The profession transformed into a hub for global healthcare and evolved as a multidisciplinary and multifaceted field in recent times. Some enthusiastic and vibrant pharma professionals initiated the formation of COPS Global and has been conducting webinars for the pharma aspirants. Their dedication and commitment are really commendable. I am hopeful that in the coming days also, COPS Global will continue to make valuable contribution to the pharma fraternity. Today, we have a dynamic pharma professional, Dr. Alice Paulos is with us. Hearty welcome, dear Alice. Being a part of COPS Global, I am really proud and happy to inaugurate the session. On behalf of Government TD Medical College Alipura, I wish all the participants a memorable day. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Kala Madam, for those wonderful words. Now, moving on, we will begin our scientific session without much wasting of time. The main talk is delivered today by Dr. Alice Paulos, and we have three members from three different countries as members of the panel. Dr. Jim C. Matthew, Dr. Ebin Chandra Kumar, and Dr. Vishnu S. Dr. Alice Paulos is an alumnus of College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Tirandwaram, and she has graduated B-Pharm in 1997 and M-Pharm in Pharmaceutical Technology in the year 2000 from University of Kerala. She moved to Canada in 2002, became a registered pharmacist, and worked in community pharmacy practice for five years before moving into hospital pharmacy. And she has worked in several roles in the hospital, including pharmacist for general medicine, orthopedic surgery, central pharmacy, and adult ambulatory care. In, in the year 2010, she obtained PharmD from University of Florida, and presently she is working as Ambulatory Care Pharmacist, Hamilton Health Sciences, Ontario, Canada. She's an approved clinical perceptor for School of Pharmacy, University of Toronto and University of Waterloo. I welcome you to this webinar. And now in the panel, first, Dr. Jim C. Matthew. I have great pleasure to invite Dr. Jim C. Matthew. She is also an alumnus of College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Trivandrum. She graduated M Farm Pharmacy Practice in 2013. Her, her areas of expertise includes antibiotic prophylaxis, 
antibiotic stewardship programs, and she has also chaired the Pharmacy and Therapeutic Committee. She has been involved in hospital accreditation, including JCI. She has an overall experience of more than nine years in IP hospital pharmacy. Dr. Jimsi has published and presented works in the various international journals and conferences. Presently, she is working as inpatient and sterile compounding lead pharmacist at Danat Al Emirat Women and Children Specialty Hospital, Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. Welcome, Dr. Jim C. Matthew. Dr. Vishnu S. is a clinical pharmacist at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences and Research Center, Cochin. He has completed PharmD from Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences in 2018 and is currently involved in inventory man management and pharmacy purchase. His areas of interest include formulary management, specialty drug procurement, drug query management, issue resolution, process evaluation and update, SOP creation and business support for software enhancements. On behalf of COPS Global, I welcome Dr. Vishnu. Next in the panel, we have Dr. Abin, Ibn Chandra Kumar. He has completed PharmD from Al Shifa College of Pharmacy, Perindalmana, in the year 2016. And he also holds a master's degree in pharmacology and therapeutics from the University of Manitoba, Canada in 2019. Pediatric autoimmune condition was his primary area of research during his master's. He, he has articles and editorials published in many peer-reviewed journals. And he's also a recipient of several awards and scholarships. He has received prestigious Governor General's Academic Gold Medal awarded by the Office of the Governor General of Canada to students who achieved the highest academic standing at the graduate level in Canadian universities. Eben is currently working as a staff pharmacist at Loblo Pharmacy in Canada. On behalf of COPS Global, I also welcome Dr. Eben Chandragumar. So with this, I hand over to Dr. Alice Paulus. Over to you, Alice. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Rendish. Thank you, COPS Global, for this uh, wonderful session. Thank you, Kala Madam, Dilip Sir, uh, Prashant, Manoj, everyone, for your great work. Um, and we will move on to the session. Next slide, please, uh, Manoj. So today we are going, these are our objectives, roles and responsibilities of hospital pharmacist, discuss the training and skills for a hospital pharmacist, and becoming a licensed pharmacist and maintaining the license. So for all these three objectives, we'll be looking at Canada, Abu Dhabi, and India. Next slide, please. So um, to discuss the roles and responsibilities, I thought we will present a case and then understand what are the roles and responsibilities. So here I have a patient, history of the presenting illness is a 70 year old female presenting with fever and shortness of breath. She denies chest pain, abdominal pain, headache, dizziness, or loss of consciousness. Her past medical history is significant for atrial fibrillation. She has a pacemaker in, she has a history of hypothyroidism, type two diabetes, gastroesophageal reflux disease, depression, chronic kidney disease. Surgical history includes thyroidectomy and arthroscopy of the right knee. No allergies to report. She lives with her son and denies recreational drug use, smoking or alcohol use. Next slide, please. Here I have the labs. Um, the serum creatinine is 1.8. Creatinine clearance, 27 mLs per minute. BUN is 22. Lights are, are within normal limits. Blood glucose is 140. TSH, 3.8. And the CBC panel is right there. Um, in a hospital setting, for best practice, we look at antibiotic resistance. So screening is done at admission. Uh, here, uh, I have the COVID-19 screening, which is negative because of the current pandemic going on. And 
the methicillin resistant staph aureus screening is also negative. Investigations completed were ECG uh, shows atrial fibrillation with ventricular paste rhythm, and the X ray shows consolidation. The vitals, blood pressure is 130 by 80 millimeters mercury, heart rate is 64 beats per minute, respiratory rate is 22, and oxygen saturation is 92. So the diagnosis is made as community acquired pneumonia. Her CURP 65 score is calculated as two, and a nephrology consult is ordered as well. Next slide, please. At this time, uh, Manoj, maybe we can launch the poll. And I will continue on the slides. So the medications that were ordered for this patient on admission were Epixaban 5 milligram POBID, Metformin 1000 milligram POBID, Rosuvastatin 20 milligram PO daily, Famotidine 20 milligram POBID, Paroxetin 40 milligram daily, Temazepam 7.5 milligram HSPRN, insulin sliding scale. For the uh, pneumonia diagnosis, uh, antibiotics ordered were ceftriaxone one gram IV daily, azithromycin 500 milligram IV daily, and for the shortness of breath, salbutamol inhaler two puffs Q6H PRN was ordered. I've included a link to the uh, Infectious Disease Society um, guidelines for community acquired pneumonia, how to treat it. Next slide, please, Manoj. Are we able to launch the poll at this time, Manoj? We will launch in some time. Continue, please. Okay. So, um, going on. So now that you've seen the list of medications, the medications. Um, okay. So you have seen the list of medications. Uh, what are we going to do with it? So once you get this list, you verify the order. So verifying means, is the medication accurate? Is the dose accurate? Is the frequency accurate? Are there any allergies that this patient has? Also, another important role that we do is when patients are admitted to the hospital, the home medications have to be continued. So we ensure that by talking to the patient or reaching out to the patient's community pharmacy, we get an updated list of their medication and ensure that their home medications are con continued on admission. Now, MedRec or med medication reconciliation ha has to happen at admission. It has to happen during transition from one ward to the other. Maybe this patient may get admitted to the ICU. So during that transition, nothing should fall off the profile un unless there is a reason as well as when the patient goes home, they go home with whatever medications they came in with, if it is appropriate. Um, then we look at, with the patient's current clinical scenario, are there any medication changes that need to be made? Like should we adjust the dose of any medication based on the patient's clinical scenario? So, I'm looking at the creatinine clearance of this patient and I see that the creatinine clearance is quite low. So I need to adjust the dose of a few of the medications. And I don't see any med duplication. So this is our screening process where we look at the current medical scenario and see if there are any medication changes to be done. I don't see any medication interaction. So that is another role that we play. If it was some uh, medications that interact, then we should uh, alert the team that this medication has an interaction and suggests alternatives. We can also do modification of orders. Suppose this patient could not take anything orally and we have to um, provide the medication through the uh, nasogastric tube, then we can change the medications to like um, the crush medication and administer or to oral formulation as needed. The other key important thing that a pharmacist does is monitoring drug therapy. So I mentioned that I am going to change some of the medications. Um, I'm going to suggest some changes to medications because of the creatinine clearance being low. So it's my duty 
as well as everyone's duty to ensure that we keep monitoring this patient. And uh, if the creatinine improves, then we have to get the doses, medications back on profile or change it back to the original dose of the medication. Also, we have to look at if the patient is improving clinically, like the infection is coming down, patient is clinically improving. Um, Okay, I see the poll questions here. So you can go ahead and um, give your answers there. So uh, monitoring of the patient, I will continue. So I'm looking at the patient. She's getting much better. Her white count is coming down. She's improving. Her shortness of breath has improved. She's not using the salbutamol inhaler anymore. So uh, one of the antibiotic stewardship program is we are ensuring um, the the safe administration of medication. So she is on IV antibiotics. We will be changing it to PO now that the patient can is much better. And the patient probably can be discharged um, and with the PO medications. If there are any adverse drug reactions that this patient may have, maybe patient had a reaction to the new antibiotics that were added, uh, we have to keep an eye on that and make the necessary reporting in the hospital system um, and then we participate in team rounds. So Manoj, um, we can go back to the previous slide. So with these medications, I'm just going to give you what I was going to do. So the epixaban, the dose seems to be high for the creatinine. So I'm going to reduce the dose. I'm going to hold the metformin The aerosolstatin can continue. I'm going to reduce the dose of famotidine. Um, I'll continue the paroxetin, temazepam. The septriaxone and azithromycin seems appropriate for community acquired pneumonia. So it will be ordered and dispensed as it is and salbutamol can continue. I also see that there is a medication that is missing from the patient's home medication. So when we look at the past medication, medical history, patient has a history of hypothyroidism. So I want to make sure that uh, is this patient on levothyroxine or not? So I will communicate or um, reach out to the community pharmacy, get a med list and see if the patient is on those medication. Okay, so now we can move on. And do we have the answers to the poll or? Manoj? Yes, Alice. I think uh, the most answered question is uh, some medications need or don't adjustment. Excellent. That's great. That's what I wanted to hear. Good job. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, the next one, uh, Manoj. Yeah, thank you. So up front, so you, in the previous slide, you saw what we do up front. Now, when, when the patient is admitted in the emergency department, there are some things that flow automatically and these were built in behind the scene. As you can see, uh, when the patient is admitted, the medication may not be right there at that moment. So the nurse can use the automated dispensing cabinet to access the medication. So once we verify the medication, it will appear on the screen and the nurses can go in, uh, select the appropriate medication and dispense and administer it to the patient. Also, a lot of medications may be stocked in the um, uh, ward or the emergency department. So this is by centralized drug distribution. There is also the barcoding, sterile compounding. So the IV antibiotics, they were all compounded in the pharmacy and brought to the, um, the ward. There are also guidelines and protocols for safe administration of medication. So when the nurse is going to administer that IV antibiotic, uh, she may have some questions about can, can I, what is the rate at which I can administer or what are the side effects that I have to watch for? So we develop IV administration monographs, which are readily available for the nurses to refer and use. Also, we have infusion pumps, which they can run the uh, IV antibiotics. So it has a library in it, which has the drug name and uh, the uh, dose and 
what is the uh, recommended rate of administration. So if there is, if the nurse uh, accidentally punches in the wrong um, rate, there are guardrails which are also remotely set in in the infusion pump so that they don't make any mistake. Also, suppose the patient is admitted for like a coron uh, like um, um, ACS or heart failure. We have developed order sets. The order set has a list of orders for the nurses to implement. So it's all the orders in one place so the doctor doesn't miss any of the things that have to be ordered at that time. For, for example, heart failure, all the medications that need to be uh, started on a patient that is coming with heart failure, what are the vitals to be done, how frequently it is to be done, the fluid intake and output uh, recording of that, um, uh, labs, what are the labs to be done. So all this is compiled into one set. So how this is developed is the physicians, the nurses, the pharmacists, pharmacists focus on the medications aspect of the order set. So we uh, sit together, put it together, then we submit it to an order set committee who um, after they have reviewed it, approve it, and then it goes to the pharmacy and therapeutics committee who will again review it and approve it. So now that it is available, the physician can just pull it out and fill it out and put it on the chart or uh, do a computerized order entry. So it will be all set and no, none of the things are missing. So I have just, next slide please, Manoj. Yeah, I just have a picture of the automated drug dispensing unit and the infusion pump. So as I mentioned earlier, so the automated dispensing machine, the advantage of that is that if there is a medication error, we can see who went into the, um, or logged into that, uh, under which patient and what medications they had accessed. So everything is monitored. And this is very important, especially in narcotic medications. We can track if there is any drug diversion that is happening. So with this, I'm going to now, so this is a general adult patient admission. And this is what mostly all the pharmacists working in a hospital, like in um, where patients are being admitted or transitioned to different wards do. Now, um, to be more um, in, uh, in depth, we, I will call on Jim C.K. Matthew to um, explain about the role of a neonatal ICU pharmacist. Jim C., please take on. Good evening, all. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. So, good evening, one and all. Thanks to Glo Cops Global for this wonderful platform and thanks for this wonderful webinar. So, going on with the next slides, as a neonatal IC, uh, pharmacist, I would like to explain to you few more responsibilities that the other ones, the Dr. Alice has been mentioned in the previous slides that what else a hospital pharmacist is doing in a neonatal ICU? What are the roles and responsibilities a neonatal ICU, uh, ICU pharmacist is playing? Uh, next slide. So here I'll explain to you, same like a case scenario in a neonatal ICU as a pharmacist, which we are encountering in our day-to-day -day practice. We received an extreme preterm baby of 26 plus two weeks, having a body weight of 750 gram. Baby has been diagnosed with mild tachypnea, respiratory distress, and cardiomegaly. So here comes the treatment plan from the neonatologist that the baby has been screened for sepsis. Baby has been commenced with ampicillin gendamicin, which is the prophylactic antibiotic for premature babies based upon the body weight. Then the next order from the neonatologist is to start caffeine as a treatment for apnea in premature babies with a loading dose of 20 mg per kg over 30 minutes of an infusion over 30 minutes. Then the baby needs to start with D10 at 100 ml per kg per day. So all these parameters which the neonatologist has been prescribed based on the recommendation from the pharmacist. So this is the area which we are focusing. Other than the appropriateness of an order set or other than the routine responsibilities the hospital pharmacist is doing, what are the roles or what else we can do as a pharmacist in a hospital setting? Okay, so uh, Manoj sir, can I have the poll question please? Yeah, 
So this is an order which I received from the neonatologist to start caffeine as a loading dose based upon the body weight. So what is the exact value or what is the dose which needs to be prescribed for the baby? Is it 10 mg per kg body weight or 15 mg per kg body weight, 20 mg per kg body weight or 25 mg per kg weight? All these orders, once the baby has been admitted in the NICU, they have to be supplied within 30 minutes. It's a stats order. Okay, so here is the role or here is the crucial role a hospital pharmacist is playing. So once the order has been placed by the doctor, comes to the appropriateness review from the pharmacist. If everything is within the range, the next is going to the sterile compounding pharmacist. So who is a sterile compounding pharmacist? What is the role of sterile compounding pharmacist in a hospital setting? Next slide, please. <coughs> So, sterile compounding pharmacist, by definition, I can say the one who is responsible for all the sterile preparations which are needs for the safety of the patient which is, which is really needed in a proper aseptic technique which qualifies the quality, the safety and the environmental control requirements. All these parameters are very crucial when we are going with the sterile preparation. The quality, that means the quality of the product which we are preparing or the quality of the medication which we are preparing in the aseptic technique in a sterile room have to be completed USB 797 standards. Then the safety. Starting from the prescribing of the medication till it reach the end user, that means the patient in the administration level, this should be safely administered to the patient, right? And the environmental control requirements. So. Aseptic medications we are preparing in an aseptic room. Yeah, I got the answers for the pool question. Okay, we'll discuss this after the slides. So, the environmental control requirements for an aseptic technique or a sterile preparation needs a laminar airflow, a clean room, a buffer room. So, these all things need to be completed starting from the preparation storage once the prepared medication has been transported to the ward till it reached the administration level so there are certain protocols there are certain guidelines there are certain practices which need to be followed by the compounded pharmacist or the sterile pharmacist so other than what we described or what we explained in the previous slides so verifying the orders checking the medication adr what are all the things this is another area you have to explore as a pharmacist okay together with that i just want to highlight you another area that a hospital pharmacist is working can i have the next slide please Uh, this is the picture of a sterile compounding room in our facility. We have a laminar airflow hood, we have the buffer room and we have the clean room in which we are preparing the aseptic uh, preparations. For example, the IV antibiotics, the IV fluids, uh, the total parental nutrition which I will discuss you later on the slides. This is the aseptic room which we are preparing. Uh, the next slide please. So this is another area in which a hospital pharmacist is working which is the nutrition support pharmacy. This is a vast topic. I will just briefly explain to you the main points. What is nutrition support pharmacy or what are the what is the role of a nutrition support pharmacist in a hospital sector. So nutrition support pharmacy addresses the care of patients who are receiving specialized nutrition support. It can be a pediatric patient, it can be a geriatric patient. I will explain to you what are the conditions in which a parental nutrition has been prescribed to a patient. Okay, So this, this kind of support system promotes the restoration of the nutritional status through the design and modification of the individualized. This will be a customized treatment or this support will be depends upon individual patient. This will be a change from day to day values or the day-to-day -day blood values.
so nutrition support pharmacy provide direct patient care including the patient assessment for example in a preterm baby at the time of admission itself we will check the blood gas level we will check the blood sugar level we will check all the blood parameters of the patient and we will assess which type of feeding is required for the baby which kind of access need to be prepared for the baby to provide the nutritional support either it can be a central or it can be a peripheral system and we need to monitor and we need to adjust the dose if necessary or we need to provide the nutrients which is really needed for the baby and identifying in some cases for example in some kind of uh, geriatric patient or in some kind of bedridden patient some kind of deficiency is that there so that time also we are providing this kind of nutrition support through pharmacy and ensuring that whether the parenteral and enteral feeding formulations are properly prepared this preparation part is the crucial part or this is the vital role a pharmacist is playing in the preparation of nutrition or in the preparation of total parenteral nutrition uh, can i have the next slide please so what are the indication not every patient really need a parenteral nutrition what are all the major indication in which a doctor is prescribing a patient on parenteral nutrition first one when the normal oral feeding is not possible that means if the gi tract is completely blocked or we have to bypass the gi tract and we have to provide feeding to the patient this is the primary indication whether a patient needs a parenteral nutrition or no when food is incompletely absorbed in kind of major burns or surgeries or the patient is on chemotherapy in that cases also patients are on parenteral nutrition in some cases if the patient is having any kind of bowel syndrome we cannot give the feed orally then in the patient is unable to ingest the food or some kind of home bedridden patient for example in a kind of uh, long term facility if the patients are there or some kind of psychiatric patients that they are refused to do uh, refused to take the oral feeds we have to start the pa patient with parenteral nutrition and also some kind of patients after surgery they have to go for npo for 5 to 7 days we have to initiate parenteral nutrition can i have the next slide so briefly i will tell you what are the main components of parenteral nutrition first of all what are sterile water food injection carbohydrates in the form of dextrose proteins as amino acid fats like intralipid vitalipid 20 percentage to 50 percentage we are supplying electrolytes which is very important especially in case of preterm babies potassium sodium calcium magnesium which are all the elements which are needed to sustain the life we have to provide this through the parenteral nutrition and the vitamins and trace elements so these are all prepared in a special formula and this need to be administered to the patient either through peripheral route or through central route in a proper rate of infusion so here comes the role of a pharmacist in the preparation of total parenteral nutrition can i have the next slide please this is the order set of a parenteral nutrition okay you can see in the top the demographic details of the patient for example uh, what is the calculated body weight of the baby current birth weight of the baby how many days the baby is on parenteral nutrition how many days the baby has been born so these are all the factors which we need to make sure that these are the values we have to provide for the baby to start the parenteral nutrition so in the left side you can see the doctor's orders of all the micro and macro nutrients per kg body weight of the baby and this will be calculated per 100 ml values also at the same time there are some additives also we will add into this micro macro nutrients for example you can see in the right hand side heparin so heparin sometimes you will add together with the parenteral nutrition if the baby is having any kind of clot issues we will add insulin some kind sometimes if the baby is having any kind of uh, hyperglycemia condition we will add insulin also together with this uh, total parenteral nutrition so once the order set has been prescribed by the neonatologist or the primary physician this will come to the pharmacy okay so once the order set has been received in pharmacy it is the responsibility of the hospital pharmacist or the inpatient pharmacist to make sure that these orders prescribed by the doctors are matching with the parameters of the patient or the blood values of the patient so here in our facility this orders will be checked by a primary pharmacist 
once the primary pharmacist has been checked these orders this will be blindly checked by a second pharmacist on the database and make sure that both the values are accurate so once this double checking has been happened this order set will go to the sterile preparation room there the sterile pharmacist again will calculate all these values before start with the preparation of the parenteral nutrition so all these areas starting from prescribing a order set or evaluating an order set till the preparation there are many checkpoints or many flags in which a hospital pharmacist is doing their intervention right so this has been calculated prepared and checked by the pharmacist reach the sterile preparation room in the sterile preparation room with the aseptic technique a pharmacist or a pharmacy technician is preparing this can i have the next slide please so this is how the pn formulation or parenteral nutritions are compounded it can be manually it can be with automated compounding devices which is also available and there are commercial parenteral nutrition products are available in the market but for us as a specialized pediatric specialty care we are doing this manually so once the product has been prepared there is a mixing order like the dextrose have to be started end with the trace elements and we cannot put all the elements together because in some cases if you are putting potassium together with calcium there is a chance of crystallization is there so we will add other elements in between so there is an order of mixing if this parenteral nutrition so once all this preparation has been completed the third checking part will come from the another pharmacist that those preparations prepared in the aseptic room the pharmacist who prepared this medication will read aloud the values in the syringe and to make sure that the pharmacist who is outside is evaluating the same value in the tpn order form so all these areas we are ensuring the safety of this pre preparation or this parenteral nutrition to make sure that we are safely delivering this medication to the nursing station this is how a pharmacist is playing a crucial role other than the normal dispensation and other appropriateness review these two areas are the highlights in which a pharmacist can put their intervention can work together as a team with the physicians and the other sections right so we will discuss in detail about the skills and training in the further slides forward to dr alice thank you jimsy thank you so much for helping us zoom in to the role of a neonatal ic pharmacist really appreciate uh, giving us this uh, insight into your role excellent so um moving on i'm going to um give give you a general idea about an organizational setup in a hospital pharmacy because there are so many roles for pharmacists and there are so many departments in a hospital um it's a huge um enterprise right so um as you can see in this chart there is a, a vice president for clinical support services so there is in a hospital setting there is so many services that are provided for our patients and um one and so there is so many vps and then executive vps and ceo so it goes on like that the hierarchy but when we go down trickle down to see where the pharmacy lies there is a director of pharmacy who reports to the clinical support service vp and then under underneath the uh, or who, um, there are some managers who report to the director of pharmacy there might be some pharmacist who may directly report to the director of pharmacy for example the infectious disease pharmacist or drug utilization review pharmacist but um just going back to see oh, some of the this may not be this is like a general view there might be some hospitals may have a smaller setup so they may have only a few of these managers but some pharm hospitals which are really large and has different populations like neonates uh, palliative care um surgery so all these uh, services we need a whole array of uh, pharmacy uh, members right so um any hospital which has inpatients will have an inpatient pharmacy and a manager to um uh, make sure that we all the processes in the pharmacy aligns with the policies and procedures for that uh, for for a pharmacy to meet then systemic therapy manager so 
especially when Jim C was talking about sterile compounding. So this manager is responsible for sterile compounding practices. We, do we adhere to the uh, SOPs and stuff like that? So uh, we have a systemic therapy manager who manages um, mostly chemotherapy compounding. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, pharmacists that work, oncology pharmacists that work underneath that uh, systemic therapy manager. Then there's a lot of clinical trials that go on in a hospital setting. We have more than 100, 150 clinical trials that go on. So there is a pharmacy manager uh, dedicated for the research activities. So pharmacy research manager um, manages all those uh, clinical trials, the medications that are involved in those clinical trials. Um, then pharmacy automation manager. So as you have seen, there is the, um, the automated dispensing cabinet. And there's a lot of uh, dispensing units in the pharmacy and a lot of automation is involved to make the day-to-day -day life of our nurses, our doctors, our uh, pharmacists much easier. So uh, pharmacy automation manager is there who has a team underneath that manager. Then business manager, so that is basically talking about money. So um, to make a business case to the higher up management. So this manager is responsible as a liaise person between the pharmacy managers, like the inpatient, outpatient, systemic therapy manager. So this person liaise with the, um, the higher up financial department of the hospital to make a business case and wherever we need budgeting. Um, so deals with the budget issues. And then there are outpatient pharmacies in the, our different sites. So we have a pharmacy manager for that. Next slide, please, Manoj. Um, so as I said, so many different roles for pharmacists. So clinical pharmacists for the different wards in a hospital. Then again, specialized pediatric services pharmacists. Again, for the different wards, there's general pediatrics, ICU, uh, emergency department, women's health, neonatal ICU, just like Jim C. And then specialized pharmacists, like I, I mentioned about ID pharmacists or infectious disease pharmacists, nephrology pharmacists, neurology pharmacists, cardiology. So you can specialize the, it's limitless. Like there are so many roles that you can go into. Um, then drug information pharmacist, this is like a more um, 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 uh, accessible and available service to everyone in the hospital. Whereas the previous, like the uh, clinical pharmacist who is on a ward is helping the team on that ward or the specialized pharmacist is helping the infectious disease team or the neurology team. Whereas the drug information pharmacist is available to the whole hospital. It's a, they are a information source for the clinicians, the nurses, the pharmacists, other healthcare professionals. Then drug utilization review pharmacists who constantly review the and monitor the usage of drug and see where we can save money. So that is basically as well as uh, unintentional uses of medications or um, inappropriate uses of medication. So they can run reports and review it on a regular basis. Ambulatory care pharmacists work where patients are not inpatient. They are outpatients, they are ambulatory, they come in for a service and then they get their service and they go home. Sometimes they come in for a day treatment like ambulatory oncology services. They come in for their chemotherapy and then they go home. Or they may come into a diabetes clinic, get their um, um, assessment done and then they go home or thrombosis clinic. So, so many ambulatory care services are there. We have a pain clinic. So there's a ph two pharmacists involved with that, um, HIV therapy pharmacist, um, and I'm a general internal medicine pharmacist, and I help with reviewing the medications for patients who are, uh, who are coming to that clinic and identifying issues and discussing with the team if there are any medications that need to be adjusted or there are some issues. Uh, then there is a pharmacist educator who is responsible to bring all the uh, new updates and make sure that all the pharmacists are aware of these uh, new changes, or if there is a new process that we implemented, the pharmacists are well aware, as well as we have pharmacy technicians. That is another huge support for the whole hospital. They are the, um, the people who run the show, actually. We do all this reviewing and stuff, but 
at the end of the day, the medications get to the patient due to the hard work of our uh, pharmacy technicians. Then there's a charge pharmacy for the central pharmacy where the main um, hub of activities, there will be a charge pharmacist, either one of the clinical pharmacist or a specific pharmacist is uh, placed in the central pharmacy to be the charge person for that day. And I spoke about a uh, research manager and there is a research pharmacist who helps the research activities. Next slide, please, Manoj. So just a little bit detailed about the drug information pharmacist. So a hospital has a drug formulary. So that is a um, set of, or a list of medications, the dose in which it has to be prescribed, um, that is set or made by the hospital, by a specific committee, the pharmacy and therapeutics committee. And the drug information pharmacist is responsible. They are also part of the committee, actually, the pharmacy and therapeutics committee. And they um, make sure that we have an updated and current hospital drug formulary. They also develop the drug administration guidelines. As I mentioned, when the nurse is going to hook that um, IV antibiotic, how to, uh, what are the things to uh, watch for? How can it be compounded? Like that information, that administration guideline also has um, the co compounding uh, instructions in there. So um, even a nurse on the ward, if they don't have the compounded bag, they can also make it. Some medications they can, they are allowed to make. So they can draw up the medication. Like if it is a powder, they can um, um, dissolve it with specific diluent and then put it into a normal saline bag or a dextrose bag. And they will that document will let them know what is the appropriate diluent that it can go into. They publish newsletters. They also... Uh, give alerts on a regular basis. And we are having a lot of drug shortages right now. So we can see daily email blast from uh, drug information pharmacists uh, letting us know, alerting us that we are having shortages. So please conserve your use of these medications. The next available date for this medication is like in two months or three months. So we have to be very proactive in um, making sure that we conserve our resources. Um, I mentioned about the infusion pump guardrail and then drug information pharmacist is a resource for everyone in the hospital. Next slide, please, Manoj. And a word about the antimicrobial stewardship program. Uh, I briefly hinted on this uh, when we talked about the uh, patient who came with the pneumonia. Um, now, antimicrobial stewardship program, it is uh, comprises of ID physicians, infectious disease physicians, infectious disease pharmacists, and a lot of collaborators are there. If they are working with the ICU team, the ICU pharmacist is part of that team. If they are working with the neonatal ICU, then they, that pharmacist will be part of that committee. So there's a lot of subcommittees within this uh, anti antimicrobial stewardship program. So the whole goal of the antimicrobial stewardship program is to make sure that we make the right choice of the antibiotic. We have the right dose of the antibiotic. We have the right route of administering the antibiotic. And we have the right duration of the um, antibiotic that we give to a patient, like five, week, five days or six weeks, depending on the particular infection that we are trying to treat. That way, we are avoiding the emergence of drug-resistant organisms. As, as you might have noticed, like in the beginning, we, we screened for methicillin resistant staph aureus because that is a huge issue, right? Like when we have resistance developing, our choice of antibiotics is coming down. Like we can't use a lot of antibiotics that we can commonly use when there is drug resistance. So the whole goal of the antimicrobial stewardship program is to ensure that we use medications, the antibiotics, especially in a safe manner for just the appropriate period of time and the right dose and the right route. Because especially when, uh, when we have um, IV access, we are breaking the barrier and we are increasing the risk for infection. So as soon as a patient can tolerate oral therapy, we will convert them to oral treatment. So those are some of the things. Um, so basically for a better outcome for our patients. They don't suffer the toxicity. Their, uh, their infection is cured at a faster rate. And we treat that infection with the appropriate antibiotic. Um, they also do um, uh, sensitivity testing, right? Like they take, like if a patient is coming with an infection, they take blood samples. 
they look at the, um, the uh, micro microbiological testing to see what that uh, bug is resistant or sensitive to. And we can narrow down. And some, most of the time, we may start with an empirical therapy. And then we, once we know what drug it is, uh, sorry, bug uh, that this patient has, we can narrow down and just use that particular uh, antibiotic that will work for that patient. So we can reduce the use of broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, so the other committees that pharmacists play a role, um, I mentioned, briefly mentioned about pharmacy and therapeutics committee, then medication safety committee. So it can be in different ways. Uh, chemotherapy and hazardous, hazardous drugs committee, pediatric medication safety committee, code blue committee. The basic uh, role of these committees, these are all, there are so many co committees in a hospital because it's a huge enterprise, but anything to do with medications, the pharmacist will be a huge chunk or a huge population of that particular committee. Basically, these committees ensure that the medication from its procurement, storage, dispensing, prescribing, dispensing, monitoring, monitoring of adverse drug reactions, everything. These teams will closely watch um, these um, processes in a hospital. Next slide. So I think I've mentioned uh, this. Um, and if we have any uh, questions, we can uh, have it in the question and answer session. Um, but maybe just a few words on the pharmacy and therapeutics committee. Um, so this is again, uh, this committee is comprises of physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, and a huge uh, pool of pharmacists. And um, they are a subcommittee of the medical advisory committee, which is the topmost committee in the hospital, which approves all the policies. And that becomes the practice in that hospital. So, um, the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee, as I mentioned, they, um, they, they are responsible for adding a medication to the drug formulary. The hospital has a drug formulary, right? So uh, any medication that needs to go on this drug formulary, that particular physician, if they want to add this medication, they will make a submission along with the, his team pharmacist. So they will provide the evidence. And once this comes to this committee, this committee is going to deliberate on it okay, this doctor has asked to add drug A to this formulary, and this is the evidence that they have submitted. So they will review all the evidences, all the clinical trials that support the use of this drug in the hospital, and is it cost-effective? Is it effective for the treatment? Has it any toxicities? And what is the evidence? Is it a very strong evidence uh, that we compels us to add it to the drug formulary? So once it is, uh, they are happy with the um, evidence that is uh, approved, uh, provided, as well as the evidence is uh, like it's a randomized control trial and there's so many randomized control trials uh, which support the use of that drug, definitely they will add it to the uh, formulary. Um, sometimes may, some drugs may get uh, obsolete and they can remove that from the drug formulary. Sometimes a patient is like uh, in an acute situation and admitted to a hospital and they need like um, a medication that needs to be approved at that moment. So it's not on the formulary. Again, uh, that physician, treating physician, along with that pharmacist will make a submission. Uh, this is urgent. This way we can treat this patient. This is the evidence behind our recommendation to use this medication. And um, uh, once they provide that, there are emergency sittings of the pharmacy and therapeutics committee and approve that particular treatment for that patient. So sometimes non-formulary medications uh, may get emergency approval for certain cases. Then they also monitor any adverse drug reactions uh, that is entered into the hospital system on a regular basis. And any drug recalls that are happening, drug shortages that are happening, that is also constantly monitored by this committee. And I have a link to the ASHP um, document that outlines the pharmacy and therapeutics committee. Next slide. So we are changing gear here, and I'm going to bring in Dr. Vishnu S. Uh, from Amrita Hospitals in Kerala, in our hometown, uh, to give us some insight into what great work they are doing in their hospital. So take it on, Vishnu. Thank you, Dr. Alice. I think you have covered most of my part, so it's very easy for me. I'll just cover the part, which is like uh, some things which I feel we are doing unique, uniquely, something unique to our hospital or to Kerala. 
Okay. So shall we start? Can you go to the next slide? So I think we have covered inpatient care, outpatient care. We have covered uh, uh, antimicrobial stewardship. We have covered. I'll be uh, taking care of chemo dilution, anticoagulant services, and a pharmacy administration. Can we go to the fifth topic, chemo dilution? Ah, yes, anticoagulant services. So this is a unique uh, service provided provided at our hospitals. The team consists of uh, the consultants of cardiology, stroke medicine, hematology, and a team of three clinical pharmacists who will be taking care of patients who are starting on uh, anticoagulants like warfarin or asinocumarone. What they do is uh, when a patient is started on uh, asinocumarone or warfarin, they consult the doctors. The doctors direct these patients to the anticoagulation service uh, clinical pharmacist who will counsel the patient on the, the, the dosing, how to take the medications, when to take the medications, like you need to take it at 6 o'clock. Warfarin should be taken at six o'clock so that you don't mix other the food like you don't you don't, the food doesn't interfere with the warfarin dosing. Uh, then something like uh, dietary modifications, lifestyle modifications, what to look out for uh, when you have a bleeding or what are the indications that you have internal bleeding. Uh, then they have a twenty four to seven on call service where uh, any time the patient can call up and inform their. Uh, their prothrombin level or INR <clears throat> results so that they can get a dosage modification or get an advice on doctor's follow-up consultation or any local treatment. The clinical pharmacist will be there 24 to 7 to uh, support the patient calls and they will be also doing patient counseling for these patients. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, I think outpatient care is already covered by uh, Dr. Alice, like medication history analysis, reconciliation, ADA monitoring, all those points are covered. So I'll be covering, uh, we have some points like hemophilia clinic. Patients with hemophilia uh, had, have to take factors. The dosing for these factors is, uh, this, uh, the dosing is decided by the clinical pharmacist. The factors which come into the hospital, the inventory, the proper storage, uh, all those things are uh, taken care of by the clinical pharmacist. We have a team of two clinical pharmacists in uh, hematology who, are, who is part of hemophilia clinic. Uh, they'll helping the dosing. They'll also help the patient like get enrolled to factor treatment through patient counseling. Uh, also helping them with their OP care support like 24 to 7 on-call services. Uh, there are Next comes daycare chemotherapy. We have pharmacists, pharmacists in oncology where uh, they decide the patient's uh, chemotherapy dosing. They counsel the patient on induction. They counsel the patient's post therapy so that the patient, the, there is a smooth transition uh, from the induction to the continued therapy. They also have a 24 7 on call support where the clinical pharmacist will be available for the patients 24 to, 24 to 7 for any supports. Just like, let's say the patient uh, has a fever, even has a cough. There are patients who even call, call up saying uh, any type of issue, the clinical pharmacist will be there, will be there for the services. Uh, in case of neutropenia or fever, the patients will be calling up. They will be uh, GCSF dosing also. These clinical pharmacists help in uh, adjusting. Can we go to the next slide? Then comes chemo dilution. I think this was covered by Dr. Jim C. Uh, it's, uh, it's the same as uh, comp compounding, safe compounding. Uh, only thing is that uh, clinical firms should be uh, carrying out these activities for uh, oncology drugs in our hospitals. They also uh, engage in training other health care workers on uh, managing these drugs or dilution of these drugs. They also maintain an updated database for dilution administration of the drugs, of these drugs. Uh, the team consists of oncologists and uh, clinical pharmacists. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, I am more into pharmacy administration where we have activities uh, like drug procure procurement, where we give the, we have a team of three clinical pharmacists who will give technical advisory for uh, drug procurement give market intelligence on which all drugs are coming to the market, which all drugs are going out of patent, so that uh, we can have a very, uh, what do you say, optimized drug purchase, uh, inventory management. We can also, we also give information on drug shortages, EPA shortages, 
so that inventory can be better managed. We also help in uh, process management, wherein let's say a new device is taken to the pharmacy. We help in creating SOPs for the device or new drugs coming to the pharmacy, any specialty drugs coming to the pharmacy. We help in creating the uh, SOPs. We also help in defining uh, operational standards. We have training sessions for the pharmacists, on-job training sessions for the ph pharmacists on uh, insulin, insulin dosing, insulins, uh, then uh, inhalers, all those kind of things where the pharmacists need to uh, explain to the patients, let's say spacers, all those things that the new pharmacists will need training. We also help in their training. We are a part of formulary management team. There is a PTC committee. We also help in marketing. Uh, issue resolutions and uh, product recalls is already covered by you know, Dr. Alice. So we'll go to the next slide. We have a team of five pharmacists who are taking care of hotline services. Uh, this is a customized option for a patient for taking out of formulary medicines, where we analyze when a doctor or a clinician needs an out of formulary drug, they'll give a request to us. We analyze whether uh, there is an actual need of uh, out, out of formulary drug. We'll see uh, whether a already available drug is available on the form formulary and maybe substitute that drug. If it is not possible, uh, we'll arrange an emergency time-bound supply for the same medicine. Uh, then uh, this is an efficient system to make non-formulary drugs available. Next is a patient support program where uh, there are some drugs, some very costly drugs in the market where the companies provide, uh, let's say, a free offers or some discounts for the patients where they can uh, easily buy this medicine so that it will be a cost effective purchase. But the documentation involved is very uh, tedious. So we have helped the patients uh, through this process. And this is just a service. There is no cost involved for us. This is just a service for the patients so that there is a smooth documentation and smooth supply for these products. And we also help in the inventory management for these supplies. Can you go to the next, next slide? Uh, we also take care of drug imports. India is the biggest market for uh, uh, spurious import drugs. We ensure our patients get the best of medicines with the, from the best of suppliers in India. Uh, we don't allow patients to go outside and go do window shopping and end up getting spurious drugs. Whenever a drug query, is, uh, drug query come to us, we confirm the drug is available in India or whether the drug is approved in India by the DCGA. If it is not approved, we'll go for, we'll source the drug from the international market. We support the clinicians to uh, have, uh, to be ready with the, let's say, additional uh, additives, everything, so that it's ready for administration. Then we have compassionate basis drugs, uh, which are provided free by some of the foreign missionaries uh, to the patients with cost, uh, like cost restraints, constraints. Uh, we identify these programs, we create a process for supplies, we ensure quality of supply. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, Campath is a typical example for this drug. The process involved is tedious. The patients have to uh, go from like, get, get, go from the process of getting a license to getting the supplies uh, and getting a, uh, let's say, a tax exemption certificate. All these are done by clinical pharmacists. So they can, it's easy for the clinical pharmacists because it's, they have a knowledge of uh, therapies and they can explain this to the patients. Other activities involve uh, tech support. We act as a business analyst. We also help in research. We, uh, we <clears throat> do activities on training and support for e-prescription module so that there is more of e-prescription. So there will be reduced uh, treatment errors or medication errors. Next slide. These are our uh, interesting upcoming projects like online key monitoring systems. We, there is a SIMS database, which, which we are looking for uh, internal integration. Uh, we are also looking at online pharmacy presence. And these are activities for clinical pharmacists. Next slide. Uh, so in our profession, what I feel is connecting to key people, building a Processing credibility and engaging in outreach activity is the best way to uh, say feel inevitable in a department. So, can you go to the next slide? 
these are the key skills which i feel should be there for a pharmacist in a administrative uh, setup professional skills like market intelligence product research process optimization and applied uh, therapeutics are some of them next slide so the growth the career growth is more of a horizontal growth uh, connect with people uh, get more exposure that's what we're looking at not, not of a vertical growth next slide the licensing is pretty easy in india in kerala you register to the spc you get the pass pass the exam get the certificate go to the spc you get the license every year don't forget to renew it every december that's it so fairly easy in india fairly easy in kerala to maintain the certificate uh, so that's it uh, thank you feel free to contact me for anything i think i'll hand it over to uh, dr evin who will take care of uh, pharmacy registration in uh, canada registration and maintaining the registration in canada thank you dr vishnu um i'm just going to bring in jimsy to just let let us know about the um, certification process and uh, special trainings that a pharmacist can take in abu dhabi and then we'll bring in ebin uh, dr Chan, uh, ebin chandrakumar uh, jimsy please carry on yeah uh, regarding the certification and training uh, can i have the next slide please yeah so to become a pharmacist in UAE or in Abu Dhabi, you need to have a two-year internship after your graduation. Either you are a bachelor degree or a master degree holder, you need to have a two-year internship either in your home country or you can do it here. But it's expensive here if you are work as an intern here in UAE, you have to pay to the facility. But if you have two-year experience from your home country, you can directly go for the examination. Then depends which type of facility you are working, you can just upgrade your standards and your training and uh, renewal will be on every two years. But in order to renew your license here in UAE, you need to complete 40 CME hours. Without 40 CME hours, you cannot upgrade or you cannot renew your license. Uh, can I have the previous slide please? So specifically for the sterile compounding preparation pharmacist, uh, there are so many kind of trainings available. The first one which I have to mention here is the American Society of Hospital Pharmacists in which they are providing all kind of sterile preparation certification and training. You can do it online. I just mentioned the link here. And together with that, there is Board of Speciality, Pharmacy Specialities. The BPS, they have uh, a wide variety of specialization available. Uh, for uh, sterile compounding pharmacists, you have the uh, board certification then for the nutritional support for the total panel nutrition and other kind of uh, nutrition support you have the board certification for nutrition support then they have oncology uh, ampullary chemo uh, it's a variety of uh, certification available in uh, board of pharmacy specialities and aspen which is the american society of parental and enteral nutrition so all these resources are easily available in the website uh, just go through that and if you want to specialize in any particular area other than the normal pharmacy dispensation and the appropriateness review, you can just specialize in whatever uh, profession which you want to increase your, uh, you know, uh, like your knowledge or upgrade your skills. So that's it from my side. Thank you, Dr. Jimsi. And now I will call uh, Dr. Evan Chandra Kumar to give us some insight into how to get a license in Canada and how to um, go about with that process. Uh, Dr. Eben Chandragumar, please. Thank you, Alice and other speakers for their wonderful sessions. So the topic that I'll be discussing is um, how to get licensed as pharmacist in Canada. So uh, Alice, can you move into the first slide? Thank you. So Canada, it's a vast and diverse country. It is the second largest country in the world, as a matter of fact, and it is comprised of 10 provinces and three territories. So the pharmacist licensure in Canada, it's uh, provincially regulated, which means that uh, the requirement, uh, it varies from province to province. And as an international pharmacy graduate, uh, to obtain license to practice uh, in Canada, it involves multiple steps. And PBC, uh, the Canadian exams, it's known as the PBC examinations, uh, primarily because the exams are conducted by the Pharmacy Examining Board of Canada, which is a national certification body for the pharmacy profession in Canada. Uh, 
and uh, PBC it has uh, as its constituent members is participant uh, participating provincial regulatory authorities and. Uh, on their behalf, the con PBC conducts the exams and assesses qualification of uh, pharmacists as well as pharmacy technicians uh, to ensure that uh, those who are entering the profession has the necessary skills, competencies, and clinical knowledge. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the series of steps that uh, need to be completed uh, before getting licensed as a uh, pharmacist in Canada. So the initial steps are uh, starting with pharmacist gateway enrollment, document evaluation, evaluating exam and qualifying exam part one and two. These are the common steps. So these are uh, nationally common to most of the provinces. Uh, and from then on, starting from the application to the provincial regulatory authorities, the processes are mostly dictated by the uh, specific regulations of the provincial of the provincial regulatory authorities or the College of Pharmacy in each, each province. So I'll go through each of them in brief. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So the first step is registration with Pharmacist Gateway Canada. It's a website that's uh, maintained by National Association of Pharmacy Regulatory Authority, uh, which is somewhat similar to the Pharmacy Council of India. Um, NAPRA, has, uh, NAPRA is composed, uh, comprised of all its uh, provincial regulatory authorities, and uh, they make the standard make the standards of uh, pharmacy practice in Canada uh, based on uh, the feedback and all the information and input provided by the provincial regulatory authorities from time to time, and the portal it provides guidance uh, to candidates on how to apply and complete the national registration exam so it provides information regarding both the national level steps and also the provincial level uh, requirements that's uh, needed to get license uh, in each individual province in canada and this portal once you complete registration you'll get a national id number which is called as napra id and this number, it will follow you, follow an applicant through each stage of the licensing process. Uh, so it's important that each applicant or each uh, prospective pharmacist uh, uh, applicant involved in the licensure process, uh, they need to have this NAPRA ID before uh, starting the process with the Pharmacy Examining Board of Canada. This IPG portal dot pharmacist gateway Canada dot ca. That's a uh, URL that you can use to uh, visit the website. There's a lot of information uh, covered in their pages and you can go over those topics if you want to go into details of the licensure process. Next slide, please. So the first PBC process is the document evaluation. So the Pharmacy Examining Board of Canada, they need proof that uh, your education and training in pharmacy, that's your undergrad degree is equivalent to that of Canadian pharmacy program. And uh, therefore, uh, they need to see the uh, proof of your graduation or uh, your transcript. So either a degree certificate or a degree transcript can be provided to the PEBC. So what they do is that they'll assess that degree. Um, if um, your university is an approved one, they'll all already be having uh, a copy of uh, your syllabus in their database so they'll be able to assess and ensure or inch or confirm that uh, your degree it's equivalent to the canadian counterpart so uh, the minimum requirement uh, to apply for document evaluation is completion of a four-year undergraduate degree in pharmacy uh, so irrespective of whether you have completed a b farm or farm d you will be eligible to apply for uh, farm, starting the pharmacist licensure process in canada so once you complete um, the entry of details into the PBC portal. Um, they'll generate a form for document evaluation. So that form, uh, it will contain all the information that you have uh, input, including your uh, details, your academic information, and also your current licensure status in India. Uh, and it'll generate that form, which needs to be properly certified. So it needs to be signed by you in front of a approved uh, notary or a commissioner of oath. And other documents that needs to be sent along with this one as a notarized copy of your passport, a passport accepted photo, which, which should have been taken within the last one year. In addition to that, these, these are the things that you'll be sending by post from your end. In addition, you'll be applying to your college or university to get a transcript um, and also apply to the State Pharmacy Council 
to get a good standing certificate from their end. So each of these things, that's a transcript as well as the GCS, uh, it'll be uh, the good standing certificate will be sent by the university and the state pharmacy council respectively directly to the PBC. It won't be uh, provided to you and you should not be the one who is sending it. It should go directly through these organizations. So uh, PBC, they will evaluate all the documents that you're submitting. And uh, if everything uh, looks okay to them, they'll approve it and they'll provide you with a certificate of uh, completion of document evaluation. And once the document evaluation is completed, that certificate, it's valid for five years. So uh, it's important that you complete all the steps, uh, the PBC steps and your licensure process within the five years from the approval of your document evaluation. Next slide, please. So the first examination that you'll be writing is an evaluating exam. Uh, this is something that should be taken by all for, uh, foreign pharmacy graduates who want to get licensure in licensed in Canada, except by uh, those who are from the United States of America. So uh, you can start applying for the evaluating exam uh, as soon as your document evaluation is uh, successfully completed. Um, it's a one-day multiple choice uh, computer-based exam. It's offered at uh, secure proctored testing centers, so primarily prometric testing centers. Uh, before COVID, it used to be only administered in Canada and in UK, but now because of the uh, restrictions that uh, came into effect because of uh, COVID-related travels and all, they have expanded the scope. Uh, so you have uh, you can uh, write the examination from. Uh, anywhere in the world with remote proctoring that's offered by um, PBC uh, through, the, through the exam administered through Prometric. So you have the uh, option now to take the examination um, even from the constraints of your room, room itself. Uh, past criteria for this examination is uh, scoring 60 percentage of or above. So there are 200 questions in total. It's divided into two sections of 100 questions each. You have to first of all complete the first 100 questions and then only you'll be able to like move on to the next 100. Uh, the first 100 questions, as soon as you reach the half time, uh, it will be locked uh, before you can move into the second half. Um, so anyone who scores 60 percent or above, they'll be um, um, completing the evaluating exam successfully and they'll be eligible to go into the qualifying examination. So each uh, candidate, um, uh, is permitted a maximum of three attempts to successfully clear the examination. And this is applicable to not just the evaluating exam, but also qualifying examination part one, as well as qualifying examination part two. So you can use this URL here or go to the PBC website on pbc.ca to access the um, blueprints for evaluating exam, as well as the two qualifying examinations that are administered by the PBC. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So the next examination is a pharmacist qualifying examination. Uh, so this is an examination that uh, should be cleared by not just international graduates, but also by domestic, that's Canadian uh, students, Canadian pharmacy students before they can become a fully licensed pharmacist. So uh, this examination, uh, you need to, like I mentioned, you need to successfully clear the evaluating exam, then only you can apply for the uh, qualifying examination. And qualifying examination part one and two are there. So part one is a multiple choice question examination, whereas part two, these are clinical stations. Part one is very much similar to evaluating exam and how it is administered. Uh, it's administered through Prometric testing sites, or, or like I mentioned now, through remote proctoring offered by Prometric. Uh, this one also contains 200 questions, but in comparison to evaluating examination, which was a uh, four hour, 15 minute in duration, the MCQ examination, that's part one qualifying, it's four and a half hour in duration with the same number of questions, 200. Part uh, evaluating exam, it's uh, more of like testing uh, your basics of pharmacy uh, with um, very limited clinical application type questions, but recently the question pattern have changed, um, but still like the qualifying exam is more clinically oriented with um, more applied knowledge um, that is being tested compared to the evaluating examination. Um, and uh, compared to that, the objective structured clinical examination called as OSCE. Um, so what it contains is it contains 13 uh, stations. So in each station, um, you will be um, given seven minutes to complete a task. Um, so it can be either an interactive station or a non-interactive station. Out of the 13, there are um, 
10 interactive stations, two non-interactive station, and uh, one station which is known as a pre-test station, which can be either an interactive or a non-interactive, depending on how PBC plans that uh, pre-test session. So um, the interactive stations, there will be a standardized patient, a standardized healthcare professional that is played by an actor, and they will be bringing a scenario of context that uh, you need to listen to them, you need to ask them these questions, uh, and you need to try to solve this uh, uh, situation. Uh, if there is a problem that's there, you need to complete that within uh, seven minutes. And there will be an assessor who is a licensed pharmacist uh, who will be evaluating your performance and providing you um, a pass, a marginal pass or a fail, depending on how you have performed. So your final outcome, uh, the examination outcome in the OSCE, it's based on how you're performing in all the 13 sessions, uh, 13 stations compare, uh, combined together. Compared to that, MCQ, um, unlike evaluating exam, which had a 60 percentage uh, cutoff criteria, MCQ as well as OSCE, there is no certain criteria that has been predefined as part of fail, pass or fail. Uh, so each examination, um, the cutoff criteria for pass, it will vary depending on the uh, difficulty level that was set for that examination. Because it's application type questions, um, it's uh, important because each question, each clinical application uh, kind of scenario, it can be different in terms of their difficulty level. It's important that uh, uh, they are gauged by um, like evaluators before uh, ensuring what is the cutoff uh, for each individual to pass an exam. Uh, each student might be getting a different question paper, even if they're sitting in the same examination session. Um, and candidates are just like I mentioned during the evaluating exam, they are given a th maximum of three attempts for each part of the qualifying examination as well. And uh, you can take either part one or part two uh, initially. Uh, so there is no restriction of whether you have to qualify part one first before going into part two. Uh, irrespective of that, um, if you are passing part one, you can go ahead and take part two, but that part two, part two should be completed within three years of completing part one. If not, uh, even if you have been successful in part one, you have to go back and take part one before you can take part two. Next, uh, next slide, please. So once you've completed all this qualifying examinations, evaluating exam document evaluation, once all these PBC steps are completed, uh, the Pharmacy Examining Board of uh, Canada, they will provide you with a certificate of registry, a certificate of qualification. So once you have that certificate of qualification and you also have a license uh, or language proficiency score from IELTS or TOEFL, you'll be eligible to uh, register as an intern with the uh, College of Pharmacy. Um, so College of Pharmacy, uh, like I mentioned, uh, from this process onwards, it's different for each province. So I'll be discussing um, over the next three or four slides regarding what is the licensure process in the province where I'm currently licensed, that's Manitoba. So we make a formal application to the College of Pharmacists of Manitoba here. And uh, the internship what it uh, involves is like uh, you are practicing for a total duration of uh, 600 hours. Uh, once approved by the college. Uh, so you'll be finding out a pharmacist, uh, you'll be seeking pharmacists who are willing to act as your mentor. So they'll be evaluating you over the span of 600 hours. So every 200 hours upon completion, they'll be uh, sending an evaluation report to the College of Pharmacists. And once you've successfully completed this 600 hours, then uh, you'll be able to register as a, a fully licensed pharmacist with the college. But at 200 hours, that's when uh, the College of Pharmacists of Manitoba, as soon as your preceptor provides a certificate of um, a document of completion of 200 hours, you will be eligible to appear for the jurisprudence examination. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So jurisprudence examination, it's a law exam which is specific to each province. Irrespective of which province you are licensed in, if you're moving to a different province, if you want to practice in a different province, you need to complete the jurisprudence examination of that province before you can start practicing as a pharmacist or you can apply to that college of pharmacy to be fully licensed as a practicing pharmacist in that province. So it comprises of rules and regulations that are specific to that province. 
um, the lows that are common to Canada is primarily evaluated during your qualifying exam. This one will test more of the province-specific regulations, the uh, bylaws for that prov province's pharmacy act and pharmacy regulation. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, in Manitoba, as soon as you complete 200 hours of internship, you will be eligible to appear for the jurisprudence examination. And uh, another requirement to appear for the jurisprudence examination is completion of a jurisprudence module that is hosted by the University of Manitoba Continuing Pharmacy Professional Development website. So this examination, it's offered once a month and it's a three hour online live proctored examination and it's multiple choice format. Um, so if you get 70% or above in this examination, uh, you will be, uh, deemed as uh, have passed the jurisprudence examination and upon completion of the 600 hours of internship and a positive feedback or positive evaluation report from your mentor uh, would uh, mean that you can be you can now apply to the college of pharmacies to be a fully licensed pharmacist in that province so this is specific to manitoba over the next couple of slides alice will take you over the province specific requirements of ontario college of pharmacists Thank you, Dr. Evan Chandragumar. Really detailed uh, way of uh, getting through the licensing procedure in uh, Canada. Uh, so uh, Evan has discussed uh, the requirements for Manitoba. So it's the exact same steps uh, till the clearing of PVC exams. And then you register with the um, Ontario College of Pharmacists. So they have the Manitoba College of Pharmacists. Here we have the Ontario College of Pharmacists. So that is the uh, our body that regulates our activities here. So once you register as a student with the Ontario College of Pharmacists, there are two uh, ways that you can um, progress from here. If you have completed your qualifying exams in the first setting, then you go through the PACE program, which is Practice Assessment of Competency at Entry. So um, it measures your, are you ready to practice as a pharmacist? in this province. So it's a 35 hour, so you find a PACE site. So there should be a preceptor, a pharmacist preceptor who is ready to take you on. And then um, the, it's about uh, a, a month or two of uh, duration where the first week is kind of a orientation week. And then the following two, three weeks, you will be like 70 hours in total. You will be uh, practicing as a pharmacist uh, under the um, um, this uh, preceptor. So they will then, once they see your activities that you are competent, there's a set of competencies that they have to check off that yes, you're competent in interacting with patients, you're competent in interacting with uh, physicians, identifying issues, you're following the safe practices. So there's a set of like a list of things that the preceptor has to sign off. And if they are happy with your uh, the way you are doing your work, then they can sign off. If not, then you have to do this process again. If you didn't clear your PBC exam, the evaluating exam, the, uh, the MCQ and the OSCE uh, in the first sitting, then you have to register with the International Pharmacy Graduate Program that is offered from the University of Toronto. I have a link right there. And it is uh, 23 weeks of full-time program. You have to complete eight courses. So it's a very intense, very, very intense program. Um, about uh, 23 weeks means like uh, six, six months of uh, full-time enrollment in this program. And uh, it is quite expensive, about $17,000 um, you have to pay to this program. And, but it's really good. It trains you um, how to uh, do your work, like what we do every day. Uh, it builds your confidence and it trains you for the Canadian um, setting. So, um, so, that, so once you do that and you complete that program, then you can um, um, apply for the jurisprudence exam, exactly like uh, Eben had described for the uh, Ontario College of Pharmacists, we have our own jurisprudence exam uh, administered in the same way. And then once, uh, and along with this, you have to have your vaccine training as well. Once you've done that, then you can apply for registration as a pharmacist. And that comes to about $1,000. <laughs> okay, so um, next slide, please. Now that we have got our license, how are we keeping our license? So we have to renew our license every year. Um, 
and we, we need a professional liability insurance. We have to get that renewed every year. There are two parts of our register. So your name can be associated with part A of the register or part B. Part A is when you are a um, practicing pharmacist, like you interact with patients, you dispense medications, you do all this that we have discussed so far. Um, whereas part B is where you don't have direct patient interaction, you don't deal with medications, you're mostly in administrative role, like a director of pharmacy in a hospital. So they have more administrative role, but they are still pharmacists, right? They had, they had the training and uh, they were licensed pharmacists at one time. So they want to still keep their name, then um, they, uh, um, they go into part B of the register. So for part A pharmacist, uh, we have to maintain a learning portfolio. Uh, so that is, we, have, we are attending CEs on a regular basis. We identify our um, uh, deficiencies and we make plans to uh, improve our knowledge on certain areas. Maybe you um, take a new certification. These are all uh, part of your learning. So that regular updating and learning is a key to keeping your license in Canada. Um, then you may be called to do a self-assessment uh, on a random basis. They may send you a set of questionnaire that you have to um, submit. Just like an exam, you will be going through a case and identifying the issues and marking off ABC, like whatever options are appropriate. Or uh, they may also even call you to do a practice assessment, just like the OSCE that Eben had mentioned during the OSCE exam. We practicing pharmacists may also be asked to go back and do a practice assessment. So we will have a standardized patient, an assessor, and we will be given a case and we will be dealing with the case and they will look at, are we competent and uh, strong in our area in dealing with that case? So those are the things that you need uh, if you want to stay in part A. Also, you have to work a minimum of 600 hours in the past three years. So that helps you to be in part A. Part B means you just keep, you don't have to work that pharmacist hours. Uh, you may not be called for those self-assessment. You just maintain a learning portfolio and I have provided a link. Next slide, please. And that brings us to the end of this session and we are open to questions. Let's see. So we have a question here um, from Poini Sujadan. Um, Sir, is ILETS mandatory for registering as a pharmacist in Canada? If yes, can you please mention the required score? I think Eben, you can take that question. Uh, so um, initially when you're starting the PBC process, you don't need to complete a language uh, assessment. Uh, however, when you're registering for the provincial regulatory authority, uh, so at, that's a point when you need to complete or provide them with a language assessment score. So IELTS, um, I know from the back of my mind that it's six, uh, six is the band score that's needed. Uh, each band needs to be six or above and the total band score needs to be uh, seven or above. And it is IELTS academic that you need to take, not IELTS general. Uh, TOEFL score, it's a little bit different uh, depending on whether you're taking a computer-based testing. Um, um, so you can, what you can do is uh, you can search on Google NAPRA language proficiency requirement, and you'll be able to get a PDF, which contains all the information that's specific to uh, IELTS from um, a nap, uh, sorry, the other one, um, CANMAT, um, and there is LPIP and there is yeah. one more exam. Uh, yeah. Mila. So TOEFL, yeah, TOEFL exam. So there are four options. So you can give, uh, get the detailed information on that PDF that they have. Okay. Thank you, Eben. Uh, next question is, ma'am, whether one year internship is enough for UAE registration? This is from Jubaria Rahnas. Thank you, uh, Jubaria, for that question. And I will have uh, Dr. Jim C. Matthew answer this question. Yeah, for UAE, it's mandatory that you need to have two year internship, either in your home country or you can use it in UAE. Uh, one year is not enough for you to sit for the examination. Two year is mandatory. Either you have a BFAM graduate or a master degree holder, two year is mandatory to sit for the examination. Thank you, Dr. Jimsey. Um, there is another question here from an anonymous attendee. 
I was completed, I completed my BPharm in 2017, joined in pharmacy on 29th of December, 2017. In August, 2019, joined for MPharm, continued the pharmacy as part-time job. And MPharm was completed in August, 2021. Exam was held November, 2019, and I got provisional certificate on 10th of January. Here is my question. I want to show my MPharm degree. Can I write DHA exam now by using my previous full-time and part-time experience during MPharm course or how long I have to wait? Um, can anyone take that question? I'm not 100% sure if I understand the question completely. Uh, yeah, I can give you one thing, uh, like even if you are a master degree holder, for you to sit for the licensing exam, either it's in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi or in the Emirate of uh, Dubai, uh, DHA belongs to Dubai Health Authority, okay, so for the examination, if you want to sit for Dubai, you need to have two years, and for Abu Dhabi also, you need to have two years to sit for the examination. It's not mandatory that you need to have a master degree to sit for the exam. Even a bachelor degree is enough to write the licensing exam. So if you want to show your master's degree, uh, this is not something specific to the health authority that you have to show in your facility that you completed your master's in this particular specialization so that you can upgrade your uh, promotions or things like that. There is nothing to do with your master's degree to sit for the examination. And regarding part-time and uh, full-time experience which you have in your home country, you just need to show a continuous two, year, two years of experience that I practice this, this facility for two years or uh, my experience is like one year in this particular facility and the other one year in the another facility. So a complete two years continuous experience, then you can show, uh, apply for the data flow. Then usually it will take one and one month to one and a half month to complete the data flow process. Once the data flow process has been completed, you can apply for the examination directly. You don't need to go behind any consultancies or agencies to do that. You can do it by yourself. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jimsi. Um, the next question uh, will end. Can I add on one thing to that? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. In, Ke right. in Kerala, you don't allow actually to do part time courses while a part time job when pursuing a post graduation. Uh, so, uh, it means university does not allow that. Uh, so, in, in India, it is not allowed actually. Okay. So, that okay. cannot be counted as an experience. As far as it should be a continuous working. experience and it should be directly from your uh, employer and it should be signed in an official template and because uh, UA is an authority which will scrutinize all the certificate not only at the time when you are sitting for the examination but at the time when you are renewal if you are changing your facility or if you are changing your employer from one facility to another facility you have to do the data flow sometimes again so in any point if you notice that there is a discrepancy which you are submitting the documents then you cannot sit for the examination or you cannot get the license yeah that's the point so it, it, should, it will be tricky if, she, if that certificate is shown Thank you. Thank you, Rentish and uh, Dr. Jimsi. Um, so next question, will anyone be able to pass these examinations with just the uh, KUHS BFARM syllabus knowledge? Um, who wants to answer that question? Evan, I think you just uh, uh, did the exams recently uh, for the Canadian uh, side. What do you think? Yeah, so um, the examinations, uh, it's primarily like uh, dependent more on your competencies than uh, the syllabus of KUHA. So if you have uh, like the willpower and uh, you are confident in your competencies, then I don't think like your syllabus matters. Uh, even after PharmD, like um, the scenario, like um, the actual examination, especially for the qualifying part one and qualifying part two, it's not something that we are trained for. Um, uh, because we are not learning a Canadian uh, syllabus in our system, right? So we are primarily depend on uh, DPRO for pharmacotherapy. Maybe some people are using Kodak Kimball, uh, even in PharmD or BPharm, like mostly it will be either of one of these textbooks. Uh, so the Canadian context, it's different. So uh, the primary references are uh, two books called uh, Compendium of Therapeutic Choices and Compendium of Mind Railments. So ultimately, if you put that effort, um, it's not an easy process. It's not like a 
one or two exam process it's a process that will take at least one and a half to two years in total so if you're committed to that um, i'm i'm sure certain that uh, irrespective of the syllabus that you've completed you're going to pass the exam and besides uh, we so all that uh, dr alice yes hi yeah. the thing dr. is that Ali. we cannot blame the syllabus yeah. Exactly. Like before this kuhas, we have that University of Kerala, Calicut, and all. That, that is why Dr. Alice and all other Dr. Abin are there. Exactly. Not the syllabus make you to get a job, but you need to try hard. Exactly. That is, I was going to mention that. Thank you for mentioning that, uh, the lip, sir. Uh, exactly. Like it's, it's your willpower. And as uh, Dr. Abin mentioned, you have about one to two years uh, to do this whole process. So um, you have the basic training, you have the basic knowledge, then you refer, you focus and study what is needed for these exams. Uh, as Dr. Eben mentioned, for us, it's the therapeutic choices and the minor ailments uh, textbooks. Plus you've learned Dipiro, uh, you've learned Corda Kimball. These are like the basics. And that from there, you can just narrow down and focus on these exams. And maybe uh, Dr. Jimsey, uh, how how are the uh, processes there like? Uh, it's like more or less uh, processes are easy uh, to get into the exam is easy, but to prepare for the examination is a bit hard. As Sir mentioned, it's not like I I had I completed my bachelor's in Kerala University and I completed my master's in Kohas. I was the first batch in Kohas, so it's not the syllabus that. Uh, allow you to sit for the exam it's your determination that i need to achieve that position or i need to reach that goal then only you will work hard so for me i had my uh, licensing exam in the year 2014 so i took almost six months to sit for the examination i was uh, clearing the first to last page of lipin court and dipiro to finish and sit for the examination so all the exams are tedious you cannot get all these heights within one second or it's not an easy process you have to go through the struggles, you have to sacrifice something, you have to sacrifice your family time, so many things are there. So it's, it's, it's nothing like UAE or Canada, to achieve a goal you have to work hard for that. Thank you Dr. Jinsi. Uh, exactly, the willpower and the determination, that is the key. Uh, we are all stressing on that. Um, and then um, the next question, how difficult are the PEBC exams and is coaching required? Maybe Dr. Eben can uh, give us an answer to that. Coaching is yeah, needed so, or not? Uh, coaching, yeah. Uh, so in my case, evaluating exam, it's, it's more of like this, we need a coaching um, or a prep course for that. I didn't take any prep course for the evaluating exam, but once it gets to a qualifying examination, because uh, this, even the students here, the Canadian graduates, even they are going for the prep courses. So uh, it's not like a straightforward, very easy exam because it's going to test your uh, application level knowledge um, uh, like um, with respect to the Canadian guidelines. Um, so if you can like go through company, like the two books that I mentioned and also Compendium of Pharmaceutical Specialties, so three books actually, if you can go in detail and you have, you have like plenty of time and uh, you're confident with self-preparation, uh, like you, you could go ahead and try that. But uh, most of the times, I would say at least 90% of the international graduates who are appearing for the exam, they would have taken a prep course. So some of the prep course that I can uh, mention here, um, it's Pharma Achieve. I'll, I'll type those uh, as answer to the questions um, to get the spelling right. So one is Pharma Achieve, another one is Pharma Spirit, and then there is a SolarX course. And Another one as well, which students usually take for evaluating exam, uh, it's called MISBA, but I don't know how good it, it is for uh, uh, qualifying examination because my friends, they are mostly taken the other three courses. I think MISBA has been there for a long time. I think when I- Yeah, they've been there for, yeah. <laughs> They're still there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think the training will help with the, um, the clinical exam, the OSCE. I think that- because that confidence, to develop that confidence, I think some of these training programs will help. Also, yeah, with and the also, 
Oh, yeah, sorry, just to interrupt. Uh, OSCE, the thing is, um, if you're practicing with someone, you know, it's not the same scenario in the examination. You're go going to like total, meet a total stranger there. So it's best that you take a prep course where you have to like uh, uh, discuss the same scenario in front of like a larger audience. So you, you'll you lose those inhibitions that might be there, which is one of the major hindrances when taking this kind of examination that uh, um, like uh, in a live way, they, they're... One is they are testing your confidence, they are testing your language. So um, these prep courses, they give you that opportunity to discuss it with total strangers. So that is a really important thing with these prep courses, especially for the OSCE. Yeah. And also the, uh, the PBC website, I think you have given the link to the PBC website. They have sample videos, I think, just some sample, just to see an outline, I believe. Eben? It yeah, was yeah. So P yeah, their website does have uh, uh, like uh, the sample question papers as well as uh, sample OSCE uh, stations. And also they have given a blueprint of how uh, these sample stations are getting assessed. So you'll be able to see a checklist of things that an assessor will be given. So a pharmacist will be acting as assessor will be having this uh, checklist and they'll be going over each point. Uh, so PVC, yes, they have given it in a detailed way. Uh, with three or four cases on their website. Even uh, YouTube, if you search um, uh, OSCE sample stations, you'll be having some of this video from uh, all these uh, uh, prep course administration organization. They have their own sample videos that you can see in addition to the PPC one. Okay. Um, next question, anonymous attendee. How much does a hospital pharmacist earn in Canada? Is it a good profession? It's absolutely a very good profession. <laughs> and the earning um, close to $100,000 a year, but then half of it goes to uh, the government as tax. <laughs> you make more, you, you, you give it back to the government, but we have free healthcare. So I think those are the uh, questions and Dr. Eben has answered, um, put the link for NAPRA. Yeah, and I've answered another one as well now. Okay, okay. I think that's the end of the questions. And maybe... Can I? Okay. Can I? So that's good. So that's... Mr. Hanna is having a question. Okay, I'll, I'll... May I call... Okay. Then now, may I call a student representative? Ms. Hanna K. from College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government Treaty Medical College, Alapura. Uh, to express their viewpoints about this webinar as well as to ask any questions directly to the panel members. Shehana, are you there? Yeah, Shehana, yeah, okay. Go on. Thank you. Good uh, evening. Uh, it was a great session, actually, and it was really informative, and uh, we get to know many things as a future pharmacist or as a pharmacy student, like uh, those who wish to work abroad uh, it's a really informative session. That means in Canada, UAE, every procedures and process was explained really well in this session. So uh, I think it's very useful to us students. And so some of the main uh, doubts that came up in the mind of some students are already explained through some of the questions in this Q&A session. So uh, Dr. Alice, Madam, Dr. James, Madam, uh, Dr. Ebinsa and Dr. Vishnu sir, everyone here. Uh, it was a good session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I ask one small doubt to Dr. Alice, please? No, yes, I just sir. want to know, you have shown some figures there, automated dispensing cabinet. So what yes. I want to ask is, will there be separate cabinets for different different diseases or different different wards? How does it operate there? It is for each ward. They have uh, a, a unit. So they will, um, so the pharmacist in that ward and the, they will assess the needs of that ward. If it is an emergency, some of the emergency medications needs to be stocked. If it is ICU, they have ICU specific medications that they use constantly. So they don't have to run to the pharmacy or wait for the pharmacy to deliver the medication. It's already on the, on the ward. And as soon as the pharmacist verifies, it is available on the patient's chart and the nurse can just check the, uh, find the patient on the screen, find, check the medication, and then that drawer will open and they can take. So it, it's locked cabinet. So only that medication pocket will open so that the nurse can take the medication. It's kind so of a safety mechanism too. Errors can be minimized, right? 
error error will not be there no any errors wow. can be minimized yeah and if there is any error like if something happens there is it is all logged it's mm-hmm. so we can go back and track it down who took under which patient who took and their initials will be displayed along the side of that medication and at what time that medication was taken so everything is Fine. logged Okay, thank you. Then, Dr. Jim C, can I ask one question about that? You have shown that parenteral preparations, parenteral nutritions. We have seen. Uh, I have seen that uh, different ingredients are packed in one pack. Comes in a single packet. So, how do you do that? You do it in the sterile room itself, or you, is there any, sp- any separate instruments for sealing it? Uh, yeah, we do have a aseptic room. Uh, we have a clean room. We have a buffer room, and we have a laminar airflow hood. so we are preparing all these ingredients in the aseptic room in the laminar air flow the ingredients are ordering in a like a dextrose then the amino acid then we have the electrolytes the sodium potassium magnesium calcium then the sterile water for injection then we will add the multivitamins and the trace elements so we will calculate the how much volume individual patient need then we will incorporate this we have the parental nutrition bag is there it is available in 250 ml it's available in 500 ml 1000 ml bags depends upon how much volume is needed so we will incorporate all these volumes together and lipids will be separated we we'll see lipids will be aspirated separate and uh, this will be uh, administered also separate together with the central line of the patient so all these are happening in the aseptic uh, technique in the laminar air flow hood and this is also transported to the nursing station also in a sterile bag and there is a cold storage unit is there to transport these item from the inpatient pharmacy to the nursing station this is how the process is happening thank you thank you very much um i just okay. wanted to ask uh, dr vishnu uh, when i when we first uh, planning this session uh, i wanted to get an idea how things are happening in in kerala Uh, because when we when i passed out that is like almost 25 years ago uh, we did the basic sciences and uh, all those uh, uh, regular pharmacy program and then came here uh, so it is like a lag of 25 years ke- ke- things have moved on in kerala and i have no clue what has happened and talking to dr vishnu i realized that there's so many advances that has happened in the hospital pharmacy section in in kerala so um dr vishnu you had rushed through your slides in the interest of time so i wanted <laughs> you to kind of uh, tell us especially i was so uh, surprised and really um, amazed by the uh, on call services that the oncology pharmacist does and i yes. think dr uh, dilip also had some question about uh, um the oncology services so maybe uh, dr vishnu can you uh, elaborate on the um, what does the oncology pharmacist does yes the oncology pharmacist what they do is actually they are the one who is inducting the patient for the let's say the patient is starting on chemotherapy or the treatment plan is planned from the radiation or from the surgery uh, from the time uh, the treatment plan is uh, set the clinical pharmacist sees the patient follows up with the patient like sees through the radiation sees through the chemo or if, when it comes to the chemo uh, they do the dose adjustment they talk to the patient they uh, foresee uh, what are the what, what all the it's uh, the areas the patient is going to face for a specific regimen they counsel the patient how to overcome those uh, areas like, then convince it the first thing is convincing a patient to take chemotherapy is the uh, the the most i think i i, I cannot do it i cannot do it only like oncology clinical pharmacy can do it because that's the most challenging part they face you no know, even the doctors are face, like finding it very difficult to convince the patients start on chemo the convincing is the first part then counseling the patients then uh, comes the post chemo follow ups let's say a patient goes back home he uh, antiemetics are given to the patient obviously it's given let's say the patient is refractory to the antiemetics when to change what to change to what are the other ch- other med- management techniques the patient needs to follow any dietary modifications uh, then uh, then then aseptic techniques or uh, how to like personal hy- how to uh, manage uh, personal hygiene not to uh, how to manage neutropenia all those things are counsel to the patient and also a 24 hour on call service for any issues of the patient let's say he has fever constipation any any types of let's say a patient uh, develops hand foot syndrome how to manage it 
Yeah, the patient, uh, like, uh, there, is, there, are some, there are some rashes due to some yeah. drugs. How to manage that? All those things are managed by the clinical pharmacist. Now, then uh, also Dr. Mishko, follow up. Yeah. Uh, one point. In this chemotherapy, we can see that there are a lot of businesses going in that. And yes. while selecting new drugs, and uh, yes. how can you convince the patient that this will work? One example is that uh, sorafenib tosylate, which came as the drug of choice for hepatocellular carcinoma. Yes. But there is no result. There is no result. Now we have, when there is no result, we have lenvatinib now. There are so many drugs that is coming in. Uh, so drug resistance is one issue. Then not like antibiotic resistance, but of course, of course there is uh, drug resistance in oncology also. Uh, that is one. There is there is issue, one issue of that. Then adherence is an, a next issue because once the patient starts getting side effects, he will stop the medications. But we never know. Well, we never know whether the patient stop the medications or not. The patients are not. Uh, means that is the actual thing that is happening. Yeah. The patients are not uh, like sometimes they don't stick to their word. Uh, then uh, next I thing was, is upcoming. I was trying to highlight that when selecting this new drug, there is a high responsibility for this clinical pharmacist. Yes, that is to there. That all is these there. things. Yes, 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 that is there. They also help in drug selection. Also, maybe the the chemo regimens are set for the diseases, as you all know. Chemo regimens are set. Uh, tweaking that for a specific patient is the responsibility of the clinical pharmacist. And even selecting, let's say, for the same uh, for the same disease, there will be radiation. Like, let's say for uh, osseous sarcoma, there is uh, chemo, there is chemotherapy involved, there is radiation involved, and tweaking that for a patient, let's say a patient above 60 years, he can't travel like uh, 120 kilometers every week for radiation or every week for chemo. So selecting an oral for that patient will be ideal for that patient. So that decision can be uh, like done by the clinical pharmacist, or that can that that can be done with the support of the clinical pharmacist. Tweaking like personalized therapy, we come in. I think I have an answered, sir. Is that? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, sure. And you mentioned about bone marrow transplant, Dr. Vishnu. Yes. Can yes. you just uh, give us a little bit of a bone idea? marrow transplant is yet another, uh, yet another like uh, high value treatment where, where it costs around twenty five to thirty lakhs. Given everything goes perfect, so. Uh, inducting a patient or counseling a patient to do a bone marrow therapy, what to do before bone marrow therapy, and what will be the course of treatment, what is expected out of the bone marrow. All these are done by all this counseling is done by a clinical pharmacist. And once the patient comes in, comes in calculating the BMI and adjusting the dosage of each each of the regimen for the uh, uh, transplant, all this is done by and also the counseling for the donors. Let's say uh, if there is a donor involved. Uh, counseling donors is also done by the pharmacist, clinical pharmacist. Uh, then ah, that's it. I think uh, that's it. And that's also great. the also the follow up treatment, just like oncology, hematology also. Uh, we handle hematology and oncology separately. Medical oncology and hematology separately. The same services we provide for uh, <coughs> hematology also. Last time, last time when I went to the department, my, actually one of my close friends is working there. Uh, I went to see him and the secretary is like telling me there are some patients who just need to see Dr. Shyam. So he is the king from there. Okay, Shyam in a Kandamadi, Dr. Shyam in a Kandamadi, they're happy. They're happy. They see, ah, Shyam Sara Baranyamadi, I'm happy. So it, it has come up to that level where the patients yeah. are very, like, uh, they don't need to see the doctor every time they come. See, okay, Dr. Shyam in a Kandamadi, I need to talk to him only. So he's, they're happy. So that was a very, like, I was surprised because <laughs> that coming yeah. that, that too coming from the that too coming from the doctor's secretary is <laughs> something very good. to be proud of. Yeah, something yeah. to be very proud really of. Really proud that we have come a long way. Yes, um, yes, yes. In our discussions, like there was a concern that there is not much of remuneration. A lot of work that Dr. Vishnu does, like the Compassionate Access Program, Patient Support Program, there is no remuneration for that. We do it extra, but what I was thinking is we have to prove that's the only way we can prove our value. Yes. Once yes. we prove our value, then the remuneration will come after that. Yes. Like initially there's a, again, the pharmacists here, they were not recognized like in Canada, like a long time ago, 
pharmacists were just compounders, <laughs> uh, just uh, dispensing the medication without talking to the patient. So we have come a long way and India is making a huge advance uh, listening to Dr. Vishnu, like a lot pharmacists are coming to the forefront, especially uh, this uh, story about Dr. Uh, Sham. <laughs> just see that person to get your issues resolved. So that's really great. Um, that's it, uh, Dr. Alice. One more thing. Uh, India may not be compared with the Western countries in the level of clinical pharmacy and hospital pharmacy. That's right. But one uh, in Kerala, uh, Kerala is the first state in India to introduce a Kerala antibiotic resistance strategy plan. That was in 2018. And Kerala is the first state in India. Very proud of Dr. that. Sanjeev of, I think Dr. Sanjeev of Amrita was also very active in that, in the initial stages. Now he's in Faridabad. Uh, Delhi. Yeah. He's in our Delhi. Yeah. yeah. That was, that was a very great team working, working on that. It's, that that team is still here. That's the that's the funny part. The team the, the whole core team is still here. <laughs> so, and, you, you have, and Amrita is having a good antibiotic stewardship program also, no? And I think pharmacists uh -huh, play yes. a very important role there also. That team is almost nine years old. That team is still here. <laughs> the same team. So retaining the professionals. That's also. Important that too, that too, it's 90% consists of, consists of uh, clinical pharmacists. Excellent. Oncology, hematology, antimicrobial stewardship, and transplant. These were the four departments where we like, uh, they know without, without clinical pharmacists cannot run. Inevitable. Cannot. So when, let's say there are some departments which when the pharmacist CPs resign, they just don't care. Let's say, okay, gone. There is, there, that post is le left vacant. But these four departments, Every time there is at least four clinical pharmacists working there. The doctors are demanding for them. Yeah. That's a very proud, I am I'm very proud. And uh, in pharmacy purchase or pharmacy administration, I was the only clinical pharmacist there. I had one supporting pharmacist with me. Now we are a team, we are a team, team of four now. Then we took in two more, three more people from the College of Pharmacy so that uh, we expand the team and they're very happy with this. Very proud to say. So, uh, uh, Mr. Um, I mean, Ranjish and uh, Dr. Dilip, uh, how are we concluding? Is it, I, I don't see yeah. any more questions. So, I don't see any more questions. So, this is it. I want to see Rajesh. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. I, I lost connection in between. Prashant called me in between. And my connection was disconnected. So I think we'll, we'll wind up for now. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, today's webinar was heavily packed, a lot of information. And I am happy to hear the different perspectives of, of perspectives of hospital pharmacists, role of hospital pharmacy from Canada, uh, from UAE. And also, we could hear from uh, how to reach Canada, what are the different licensing requirements, uh, and it was all interesting. Before winding up, let me just read up some of the uh, good comments that we received in the chat box. Uh, Preeti Nambia has commented that it is clear, concise, and very interesting. And then Raji, Dr. P.K. Srivuma, Sir, C.B. Krishnan, J.P., Nijay Prakash, Sir, have all commented that it is a good session, very interesting one. And so that's it. Uh, now I would request uh, Dr. Dilip sir uh, to please propose a word of thanks to our excellent panelist. Over to you, Dilip sir. Thank you, Mr. Rajesh. Good morning, good afternoon, and good afternoon, good evening to all. Respected Kala Madam, senior faculty members and principals, other professionals, colleagues, members of the panel, and their delegates. This is the second day of our second series of Pharma Fair webinars organized by COPS Global. Today we have College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government Medical College, Alapura as our session partner. And this is for the first time we are introducing such a, such a thing. Our program is inaugurated by Dr. Kaladi, Professor and Head of College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government KD Medical College, Alapura, and an alumnus of our College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Trivandrum. And on behalf of the COPS Global, I extend our sincere thanks to you, Mayor. And this was a very elaborate session, and we have honored to have Dr. Alice Paulos, an alumnus of College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government Medical College, Trivandrum, to share her expertise in the role and responsibilities of hospital pharmacists with us. 
She was a brilliant student of our institution and a reputed practicing hospital pharmacist. The session she presented was really informative and supported by so many suitable examples. On behalf of COPS Global, I extend your, our sincere gratitude to you, Dr. Alice Paulos. Today we have some great personalities in our panel list, Dr. Abhin Chandra Kumar, Dr. Jim C. Matthew, and uh, Dr. Vishnu S. And they made it a wonderful session. Also, they shared their experience in Canada, UAE, and Kerala. Thank you. On behalf of the COPS Global, I extend our sincere gratitude to all for making this webinar a memorable event. Ms. Shahana K., a sixth semester student of CPS GTDMC Alapura, joined our webinar as a student panelist. And uh, this, this is also for the first time we are including such a student into our panel list. I express our sincere thanks to you, Ms. Shahana. I take this opportunity to extend our sincere thanks to all the senior faculty members, principals of various pharmacy colleges and other pharma professionals for joining us today. Today we had a very good number of registrations and I thank all the students delegates who made this webinar a successful one. On behalf of COPS Global, once again, I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.